Welcome to St. Stephen's. Welcome to everybody who is here on this Palm Sunday. We have a few announcements, of course, because we got we got a really laid back week. Nothing's going on here at all. That's a joke, of course. It's Holy Week. Uh, so let's talk about it a little bit. Of course, uh, as I said, uh, we do have a very busy week. On Tuesday of Holy Week, uh, well, of course, today's Palm Sunday. Just we should probably go over that first. Uh, as soon as I'm done with the announcements, I'm going to ask you all to get up and come into the back and we're going to do a, a blessing of the palms in the back. You'll hear a gospel reading and then we're going to process in together. And so that's going to be happening this morning. We're going to have a long gospel reading. Uh, the two deacons and myself are going to be doing it. So that'll be great. That'll be a lot of fun. Uh, one of the deacons didn't know she was going to even be doing it until about uh, 15 minutes ago. So that's good. Uh, so uh, that's happening today. On Tuesday, uh, April 12th, we will be doing, uh, we will actually be doing the Requiem Mass for the unknown person from 1962. We'll be doing that service at six o'clock that night. The weather's gonna be pretty awful that night, I guess. It's gonna be raining pretty hard. Uh, so I don't know if we're actually gonna process out to the Memorial Garden, but if nothing else, I will go out there and bury the ashes after the service. So, but we will do the Requiem. We'll say the goodbye and honor that person Tuesday night at six o'clock. So please plan on coming for that, that uh, Mass that night. Uh, there is no Wednesday night mass this week, so don't worry about the Wednesday night mass, but we do have Monday, Thursday at 7 o'clock. That does include optional, I make that very clear because uh, one of our parishioners this morning made very clear, that's optional, right? <laughs> Kathy McMullen. Um, <laughs> That's optional, right? I don't have to go up and have you. No, you do not have to go up and have your feet washed. But um, there will be an opportunity for that if you would like to. At that service, uh, we'll have the stripping of the altar. Uh, all of those things are going to be happening as well. The stripping of the altar is probably the, the high point for me anyway of the Monday Thursday Mass. It's really it's very moving. Uh, Good Friday, we have two services. We have a noon uh, Good Friday service, including communion from the reserve sacrament. We're going to be having the solemn uh, colics. We'll have adoration of the cross. We'll be doing all of those things as well. Then at 3 o'clock will be the uh, stations of the cross on Good Friday. So we'll be doing that here. Uh, there will not be a 6 o'clock station of the cross this week. I do have to say that, though. Uh, our Stations of the Cross service during Lent was incredible. We, we were very well attended. I can't believe it actually so uh, it started out it was just me and then it was like sandy and me and then it became we had almost 10 people on wednesday which for station of the cross is great so i've been really impressed by that if you've never done a station of the cross and if you have time at three o'clock this week come for the stations of the cross it'll really be beautiful a little different is uh james will be playing at this michelle you're gonna, you're gonna be yeah. michelle will be uh chanting. chanting very good so uh we'll have music which is what, not what we do during Lent, so that's very good. Holy Saturday, we have a 10 o'clock service on Holy Saturday. If you have never been to the Holy Saturday liturgy, please come. It is by far my favorite liturgy of Holy Week, except for the Easter Mass, of course, but uh, that's not really, that's a whole other thing. Um, but our Holy Saturday service, very solemn, very short, very sweet, but I, uh, I love that service because I get to preach about the harrowing of hell. If you don't know what the harrowing of hell is, come along. You'll hear about the harrowing of hell. One of my favorite things in the church, one of, the, one of my favorite things for being a Christian anyway. So that is uh, Holy Saturday at 10 o'clock. And then, of course, we do have our Easter Day service. Uh, we will be having a baptism that day. And we'll be having, uh, I know that a lot of you will be heading out for home, for meals, and different things like that. But we are going to have a little coffee hour. Uh, the, uh, the baptism 
uh, child's family are gonna, I think, have cupcakes or something. So, um, so uh, join us for that. But be here for Easter, of course. We want you here for Easter. That's the big day. Okay. So, what else is going on? Uh, let's see. Easter flowers. Sandy, do you want to share a little bit about Easter flowers? So it's not just me talking all the time. Um, yes, you can contribute to the Easter flowers. That's what I would have to say about. There are envelopes in the back. There are envelopes in the back. There's some downstairs on the one of the coffee Great. tables too. So if you forget and you get down there, um, that's an opportunity. But. Um, that we'd need to do that so that James can get the you bet. questions in the So if you have to, either in memory of someone or in honor of somebody, please make sure you write that in. James, when do you need the deadline for getting all of those names? Saturday is good. Saturday would be good. So make sure you at least get the names to James by Saturday if you would like uh, Easter flowers dedicated in honor or in memory of someone. Oh, uh, let's see what else. Uh, healing prayers today. Deacon John will be doing healing prayers in the back. So if you would like some healing prayers for you or for someone else in your life, after you receive communion, head on back. Deacon John will be praying for you for that. Today, before the, um, before the sermon, I will be reading uh, two pastoral statements from the House of Bishops, uh, which were released this week. Uh, one about uh, the war in Ukraine, one about trans people, so I will be sharing those. And then my sermon is kind of a going off uh, from those statements as well. So uh, it's been a long time since we've read a pastoral letter in church, so it's kind of a nice thing to, be able to do. And I'm very proud of the bishops for what they wrote, so uh, we'll be doing that as well. Any other announcements? Yes, Sandy. Coral Leaf and Development, don't forget, and we will have an in-gathering the first Sunday after Easter. Wonderful. And Episcopal Relief Development is actually being mentioned in the Bishop's Letter this morning, so that is a good thing as well. So, yes, please give generously to Episcopal Relief and Development. It is a great and important thing. And you said uh, sometime after Easter we'll do the end gathering. The very first Sunday after. The very first Sunday. That's great. After. Uh, that is good. Uh, looking ahead down the road just a little bit, May 22nd we'll be doing our rogation. Uh, procession. Hopefully the weather will be good. We won't have snow still in May, hopefully. That will be a good thing. Uh, and so May 22nd, uh, if you don't know about rogation, that is the day where we bless uh, seeds and we bless gardening implements and all of those other things. At the end of Mass that day, we usually go out into the memorial garden, into the labyrinth, and do a little blessing at that time. Also on that day, we're going to do something a little different than we normally do. We have a second set of unknown ashes that we're actually going to inter on that day. So we'll be doing that as part of our rogation celebration. You'll be hearing a lot about that between now and May 22nd. May 22nd seems like a long time away for me right now because I've got to get through this week. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's, uh, I'm going to take a couple of days off after Easter too. So Monday and Tuesday after Easter, I'm going to take those two days off. I'm heading down to South Dakota. You know, sunny South Dakota. <laughs> that's where you want to go for I didn't get to go to Florida this year, so the well, second best is South Dakota. <laughs> what better place? Huron, South Dakota. That's where I'm going. Huron. That's the place to go. That, the palm trees are waving and calling for me in Huron, South Dakota. With that, if you will please come back and join me. I'll make sure there's any other announcements. Are there any other announcements? If not, if you'll come on back, we'll do the, uh, the Palm Sunday liturgy. <laughs> in the name of the Lord. Peace be heaven and glory in Christ. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of these mighty acts, whereby you have given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. 
Jesus went on ahead and went up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And he rode along. People kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The Lord be with you. And yes. also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph. It was proclaimed the King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may evermore hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. If you hold your branch, your, your palms up, we're going to bless them in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to sprinkle them, so be prepped for that. I always tell you, Alright. Let's bring it back there. There we go. And get you all. Very good. Blessed. Amen. Oh, we're going to follow Andrew in. And now we will make our
Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of our lesson today. But before you do, um, as Paul is coming forward, just take a look at the uh, preface that we have beginning on page 5 uh, regarding some of the anti-Semitic language that we hear in Scripture regarding uh, Jewish people and how we need to be aware of that as we listen to these readings. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I might know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, <clears throat> and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. 
from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. To God. <laughs>
of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. <clears throat> Please be seated. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desi desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. <clears throat> For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. <clears throat> then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. <clears throat> for the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began asking one another, which one of them, it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. So that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. <clears throat> But I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. He said to them, <clears throat> when I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, no, not a thing. He said to them, but now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless. And indeed, what is written about me is being fulfilled. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He replied, it is enough.
came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. <clears throat> While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called <clears throat> Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, J Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? And those who were around him saw what was coming. They asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was allowed, uh, was following at a distance. When they, had when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. There was a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, and s who stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, you are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, yet another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And kept asking him, prophesy, who is it? It's on him. When day came, He replied, if I tell you, you will not believe, and if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All of them asked, are you then the Son of God? He said to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. <coughs> Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. <clears throat> they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insisting and said, he stirs up the people by teaching uh, throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began to this place. And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, 
he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wait wanting to see him for a long time because of what he heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put, on an put an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this day, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is perverting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence, and have not found this man guilty of any of the charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demand, demanding with loud shouts that he be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. <laughs> Led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. And they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this, when the, when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also who were criminals were led away to the place of, uh, to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on the right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanging there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man... was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying, Father, 
Into your hands I commend my spirit. said, certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they returned, they rested according to the commandment. Well, as I said in the announcements, we are going to read, I'm going to read, uh, two pieces that just came out from the House of Bishops. So the first is a statement from the House of Bishops on the conflict in Ukraine. To the faithful in Jesus Christ throughout the Episcopal Church, we are gathered at a moment of profound jeopardy to the principles of international law and peace. As we meet and pray together as a House of Bishops, Ukraine, an independent, sovereign nation that has posed no threats to others beyond its borders, has been invaded by military forces of Russia without provocation and without justification. On December 1st, 1991, the people of Ukraine voted in a nationwide referendum on the question of their future. Nearly 85% of the electorate took part in that referendum. The question set before them was simply this, do you support the act of declaration of independence in Ukraine? More than 90% of those casting a vote voted yes. The independence of Ukraine was and remains an act of clear, principled self-determination. In the 30 years since then, the people of Ukraine have, through challenges and difficulties, forged a strong sense of national purpose and identity. There is a direct link between our baptismal covenant to respect the dignity of all people in Christ and the demand to respect the will of nations to determine their own destiny, the rule of Juice Kogans, I believe it is. You, anyway, international law. It's an international law. When expressed freely through the ballot box, we acknowledge and lament the failure of many of the nations where the Episcopal Church lives and gathers to respect and defend the, that fundamental principle in their own policies and actions in the years since the founding of the United Nations. Yet that acknowledgement must not stay, stay us from denouncing the utter depravity of the war now unfolding in Ukraine. It is evident that Russian military forces have directly and indiscriminately attacked civilian residences, medical facilities, even agreed corridors for the humanitarian withdrawal of civilians in areas of combat. I'm gonna pause there. As more news has come out, it's much worse than any of that. 
it has been indiscriminate slaughter and massacre that we have seen. I'll go back to the letter. These actions are a fundamental violation of the rights and dignity rightly accorded all people and a flagrant, a fl a flagrant, a flagrant breach of international norms. As the bishops of the Episcopal Church, we pray that the nations of the world call upon the Russian government violence, especially against the innocent, that our victim, uh, that our siblings in the churches of Russia and Ukraine remind their leaders of Christ's commandment that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, a commandment we believe provides no justification for violence elderly and those otherwise vulnerable, that God protect and defend those who, with great courage, have stood and spoken against the choice for war in the councils of their governments, their churches, and in the public square. That God support and encourage our churches in Europe and our sister churches of the Anglican Communion present there as well, who even now are receiving refugees in their cities and helping them rebuild shattered lives. That all refugees, regardless of the reasons for their flight or the country of their origin, be received with equal dignity, equal hospitality, and equal treatment. That the work of diplomats and peacemakers and the voices of all those who in authority labor without ceasing to bring a swift and just end to this conflict and the preservation of Ukraine's independence and autonomy under conditions of security and tranquility. And that the Prince of Peace, whom we know also to be the judge of nations, will work through us and all followers of Christ to build a more peaceful and just world where all people can live in, sa in safety, where the will of their nations can be freely expressed and fully lived out, and where God's dream of a beloved community of all people and nations is realized through the works of mercy and compassion. We urge all faithful members of the church to support the relief of the Ukrainian people as it is being carried out by Episcopal relief and development and by the convocation of the Episcopal churches in Europe. This was signed at Camp Allen, Texas on March 19th, 2022. And while they gathered, they also uh, put a resolution forward regarding trans people, which I'm going to read as well. This was also adopted by the House of Bishops at Camp Allen on March 19th, 2022. In light of the baptismal covenant's promise to see Christ in all persons and the recent, uh, and the recent, uh, and, and uh, many actions by uh, elected officials in Texas, Alabama, Arizona, Idaho, Episcopal Church gathered at Camp Allen, Texas on We decry legislative initiatives and government actions targeting trans children and their families. We urge all in our church to create safe places and shield all people from harassment based on gender identity. And so that is where we are on this Holy Week of 2022. We begin this Holy Week with a war in Ukraine and not just war, as my little side said. It began, this Holy Week begins with atrocity and mass slaughter and systematic murder. We begin with trans people's rights being challenged in outright and blatant discrimination right here in our own country and right here in our own state. It's not just sad, it is maddening. It is frustrating. But it also just as maddening, maddeningly is reality. As we approach this Holy Week, we need to keep in mind these realities. And in that dark light of what is happening, we need to remember that what is about to happen in Holy Week is about us as much as it is about Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about all of this in some abstract way. I mean it when I say this 
is our story too. This gospel we have heard, it's our story too. Let's face it, we've all been there. Our liturgy today, this service we have this morning, begins on a high note. Jesus enters in a hail of praises. The crowds acclaim him, they wave their palms. It is a wonderful and glorious moment as Jesus enters Jerusalem, praised by everybody. But then everything turns and turns very quickly. What begins on a high note ends on the lowest possible note possible uh, that we can even imagine. The crowds quickly turn against him. He is betrayed, he is whipped, he is condemned. We see this very same thing happening right now in Ukraine where innocent people, men, women, and children are being slaughtered and ravished. I don't know if you've heard the story. I'm gonna just make an aside. Um, the, the story that came out this past week about Russian soldiers ripping earrings out of women's ears and saving them as uh, trophies. That is what we're dealing with. We see it right now in our own country and in our own state where trans people are being unjustly condemned for who they are. And although we hopefully have not physically experienced the things that we heard about in our gospel reading today, most of us here at least have been here emotionally. We have known these highs and we have known these lows in our own lives. We have known the high notes, those glorious happy moments that we prayed would never end. And we have known the low notes when we thought nothing could be worse. And sometimes those highs and their lows have happened just as quickly to us as they did for Jesus. Now, unless we make personal what is happening to Jesus in our gospel reading for today and throughout this whole coming week of Holy Week, it remains a story completely removed from our own lives. As we hear this reading, we do so in our relationship and we relate to Jesus in his suffering and his death. And how can we not? When we hear this gospel, this very disturbing reading, and it is a horribly disturbing reading if we're really listening to it, how can we not feel what he felt? How can we, not, how can we sit passively and not react in some way to the violence done to this innocent man? How can we sit here and not feel in some small way the betrayal, the pain, and the suffering? After all, none of us in this church this morning have made it to this point in our lives unscathed in some way. We've all had something happen to us somewhere along the way. We all carry our own passions, our own crucifixions with us. We have all known betrayal in our lives. We have all known what it feels like to be alone, to feel as though there is no one to comfort us. Whenever we feel these things, it is then that we are sharing in the story of Jesus. We are bearing in our own lives the very wounds of Jesus, the bruises, the wet marks, the nails. And when we suffer in any way in this life, and we've all suffered, we've oftentimes cried out, where are you, God? Most of us have prayed that prayer at least once in our life. That prayer is being prayed right now in Ukraine by people who are truly wondering where God is as a foreign nation invades them and systematically tries to destroy them. That prayer is being prayed by trans people right now, especially young trans people in our nation and in our state right now. That is what the story of Jesus shows us very clearly. Where is God when we suffer? Where is God when it seems as though everyone has turned against us and abandoned us? Where is God in our agony? Where is God? Well, the story of Jesus shows us where God is in those moments. Where is God? God is right here. God is suffering with us when we suffer. How do we know this? Because we can see it clearly and acutely in the story of Jesus. As I said, this gospel story we heard about, that we heard this morning, is our story as well. For those of us who carry wounds with us, we are the ones carrying the wounds of Jesus in our bodies and in our souls as well. Every time we hear the story of Jesus, torture and death, and can relate to it, every time we hear that story and feel what Jesus felt, because we too have been maligned. We too have been attacked and betrayed and insulted and spat upon and discriminated against in any way. It is then that we too are sharing in the story of Jesus. Every time we are turned away and betrayed, every time we are deceived, and every time we feel 
deep, real spiritual pain we are sharing in Jesus' passion. When we can feel the wounds we carry around us begin to bleed, when we hear the story of Jesus' death, that story becomes our story too. But, this is an important but, there's something wonderful and incredible about all of this as well. The great part about all of this, it, about being part of the story of Jesus, is that we also get to experience the whole story. Look at what awaits us next Sunday. Those sufferings we hear about today and in our own lives, what is happening in Ukraine, what is happening to trans people right now, they're ultimately temporary. There are many times, how many times have we sat there when here in this own church and we complained and lamented back in the day when we were fighting for LGBTQ rights and we said, it's never going to end. This is the way it's always going to be. And things have turned around, at least for us here in this diocese, for everything we stood up for, for what that window stands for. We stood up for that. We were often alone, but we stood up. And as a result, we knew that one day, if we were resilient, that it would be a temporary pain that we were feeling. That is hopefully what we're dealing with with Ukraine, hopefully what trans people are dealing with right now. But what we celebrate next Sunday, what we celebrate next Sunday, that is unending. That is forever. Easter morning awaits all of us. That day in which we will rise from these ashes of this life, the ashes of Ash Wednesday, the ashes of these palms that we wave this morning, the ashes of war and the ashes of discrimination. And we live anew in that unending dawn. Next Sunday reminds us that no matter how painful our sufferings have been, no matter how deep our wounds are, God, who has suffered with us, will always raise us from that pain of ours, just as God raised Jesus from the tomb. God will dry all of our tears. All of our pains will be healed in the glorious light of Easter morning. This is our hope. This is what we are striving for in case we might forget what that is. Our own Easter morning awaits all of us. So as difficult as it is to hear this morning's gospel reading, as hard as it is, to relive our pains and our sufferings as we experience the pains and sufferings of Jesus. As truly miserable as it is to hear the atrocities of what's going on in Ukraine, or the constant, constant and uh, concentrated and deliberate transphobia that we are experiencing in our own country and state, just remember that in the darkness of Good Friday, the dawn of Easter morning is about to break. With it, the wounds disappear. The pains and sufferings are forgotten. The tears are dried for good. The empty grave lies behind us. And before us lies life. Unending, pain-free life. Life without war. Life without violence. Life without discrimination. Life without hatred. Before us lies a life triumphant and glorious in ways that we can only here and now just barely comprehend. Amen. 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 As we journey this week with Christ and celebrate the Paschal mystery of his death and resurrection, let us earnestly pray for those following the way of the cross and for all peoples everywhere, saying, hear our prayer. Please stand. Please stand. <clears throat> for the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world, sharing the death and resurrection of Christ. For Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury. For the Church of North India. For Michael, our presiding bishop. For the Episcopal Diocese of San Diego for the Episcopal Diocese of North Dakota, and for Tom, our bishop, for St. Peter's Walhalla, and the Daughters of the King and Mother's Union, and for all who minister in your name, and for all your holy people, God of strength. <laughs> for Temple Bethel and our Jewish sisters and brothers as they observe Passover, and for the Islamic Society of Fargo-Moorhead as they observe Ramadan, God of strength. <laughs> 
for those who are preparing for new birth in the waters of baptism this Paschal season, especially for Odin John Benson, who is to be baptized next Sunday, and Elijah Nichols Anderson, who is to be baptized on April 27th. God of strength, hear our prayer. For this parish community of St. Stephen's, for Jamie, our rector, for myself, your deacon, for John and Jean, our wardens, and for the vestry of St. Stephen's, and for all of our ministries, we pray today especially for Jordan Schroer, Aaron Schwert, and Andrea Olson, Carol Spurbeck, and Dinah Stevens, that we may know the way of the cross to be the way of life and, and peace. God of strength, hear our prayer. prayer. For our President Joe and for all who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions for the welfare of all. God of strength, hear our prayer. prayer. For the people of Ukraine and an end to the war there. God of strength, hear our prayer. prayer. For the sick and the suffering, for the dying, for all who are oppressed, afflicted, or in despair, and for those who mourn. We pray today especially for Josh, Michael, Alice, Judy, Julie, Greta, Jonathan, Bob, Patty, Betty, Leon, Sam, Peggy, Val, and Dorothy. God of strength, hear our prayer. prayer. For those who are neglected, who are lonely and forgotten, and for all of those in special need, especially this morning, we pray for Kate, Carolyn and family, the Stone family, Steve, Alex, and the Erickson family. God of strength, hear our prayer. For our families, friends, and companions, and for all those we love, and for our own intentions, repeated either silently or aloud, I invite you now to share those. God of strength, hear our prayer. For those who now rest in your love, praying especially for Shirley Carbno, Suzanne Neer, Harry Scouten, Jackie Parsley, for the unknown person whose ashes will be buried in our memorial garden, for June McDonald, Odella Henley, and Chad Stone. God of strength, hear our prayer. Remembering the Blessed Virgin Mary, Stephen the Martyr, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to you. God of strength, hear our prayer. prayer. Gracious God, the suffering and death of Jesus, your only Son, makes us pleasing in your sight. <laughs> Alone we can do nothing, but through his sacrifice may we receive your love and mercy. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I do want to add one thing to what I was saying in my sermon. Um, and it's just kind of an important thing we should really keep in mind. And I know uh, Kathy McMullen is, even though she didn't say or even look at me in any way, I, I heard her voice kind of nudging me. We need to be very clear about when we're talking about Ukraine and the war there, that we not resort to uh, a sort of phobia against Russians. It's an important part of who we are and believing in the worth and dignity of all people according to our baptismal covenant. What is happening there should not be some way in which we all of a sudden are saying all Russians are bad people because of this. This is an important part of what it is to be uh, sort of on the growing edge of living in a bizarre and horrible time of violence and war. Uh, this is a governmental issue and we shouldn't be judging people. I've been hearing stories about people who are protesting Russian vodka and not going to Russian restaurants in the United States, like in Chicago and places like that. That's absolutely horrible. Do not, you know, not that I have to tell you guys this, but if you hear it from other people, speak out against it and say that that's also not right to be doing that as well. So uh, just something I, uh, I know Kathy and I had kind of talked about this at some point, and it was all of a sudden just something I had to talk about. Uh, one name I do want to add to our prayer list today is uh, Greta Taylor. Greta is having surgery tomorrow on her back. I will be sending out a prayer request later on today for Greta. So we'll be praying for Greta as she has some back fusion uh, uh, surgery. So please be praying for her as well. Well, anyway, uh, there aren't any birthdays listed, but are there any birthdays we should be remembering today? Indeed. Wonderful, Michelle. My brother Steve tomorrow turns 50. Wonderful. I believe he's on the list, right? Yep. Yeah. 
And Steve lives in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. Okay, we will send the prayers down to Steve. Uh, the one Jelinski sibling I have not met. So I still wait to, to meet Steve at some point. I actually did not believe he exists because every time I try to meet him, he's evasive and he goes off somewhere else. And Michelle and I have a running joke about why that is, but I won't get into that right now. So. My cousin Jim and his birthday is tomorrow. Uh, your what? Cousin, my cousin. Your cousin Jim's birthday is tomorrow. Very good. Are there any more on the list? Yes, we have Don, Janet, and Janie. Or, am I reading this right? Somebody wrote. James. Starts with a J, kind of looks like June. Or... Okay, yeah, okay, great, great. And my sister. And your sister, what's Sister you? Cecile tomorrow. Cecile, and that's a good Catholic name. Yes, Cecile. Amy? My cousin Sarah, she turns 24 on Friday. Wonderful. My brother Philip had his birthday yesterday, he turned 39. 39, very good. Where does he live? New Jersey. Wonderful. My mom. Oh, your mom, we love your mom. <laughs> it's, she's the 13th. The 13th is her birthday. Yes. Very good. I hope she's watching. We'll send her a special, a special blessing. And that's very good. We, we have a running joke too, Stephanie, about her poor mom who uh, warned her one day not to, not to slap the priest. So, <laughs> so that's a <laughs> phrase like that. Uh, it was not phrased quite that way. No. It was uh, female dog slap. The, Priest, but didn't say female. You know, say that. So, and then I made that announcement during uh, after Stephanie's uh, sermon one of the Wednesday nights, and her mother saw that. That was great. So, uh, we will send birthday blessings to your mom. What's your mom's first name again? Rita. Rita. We will. Uh, we will definitely give birthday greetings to Rita. We need to get her to St. Stephen's. We definitely need to get her here. She thinks we're very irreverent, and I just <laughs> love that. I wear that like a badge of honor, so very good. Thus proving her point. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> she might come and dog slap, uh, female dog slap the priest, so that would be good. Any other birthdays we should be remembering? <laughs> Wonderful. So on page, uh, let's see, I better look with my all my glasses. Page 15, I think. That's a 15. Uh, let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts see your peace, which passes understanding. Abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a blessing on everybody who's having a birthday this week in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I see Sandy Kent has her baptism anniversary on the 15th. Any other baptism anniversaries we should be commemorating? All right, so let's pray for Sandy on her baptism anniversary. In baptism, O God, your servant was received into the household of God and filled with the light of Christ. Sustain her, gracious God, in your Holy Spirit. Continue to give her an inspiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. May we walk always as children of the light and keep the flame of faith alive in our hearts. May we live each day knowing our true identity as beloved children of God. And when Christ comes, may we go out to meet him with all the saints in the heavenly kingdom to live with him forever and ever. Amen. And a blessing on Sandy on her baptism anniversary date in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And I see we do have a uh, all wedding anniversary. Uh, Rachel and Jeff Freuland, uh, for those of you who might not know Rachel and Jeff, they are uh, Alice Howen's daughter and son-in-law, former rector here, Jim Howen. Uh, that's his daughter and son-in-law. They were married here, I'm pretty certain. Uh, Jim must have done that. That awesome wedding, I think. I think so. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know how those things are done. I don't have kids. I don't know if you do their services or not. Anyway, I know they were married here. I'm pretty certain about that. Anyway, so we'll pray for, uh, uh, pray for Rachel and Jeff. Is there anybody else wedding anniversaries we should be remembering? All right, let's pray for uh, Rachel and Jeff. Oh God, the giver of all that is true and lovely and gracious, Grant that by your Holy Spirit, these your servants may continue to become one in heart and soul, live in fidelity and peace, and obtain those eternal joys prepared for all who love you. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a blessing on Rachel and Jeff, in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. 
Peace, everybody. Peace. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For our sins he was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels, and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life, you formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your, your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed the glory, giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. supper was ending, Jesus took a cup of wine, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Stephen the Martyr, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever, through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. 
and for us today and our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are, who are, who are welcome at this altar. And please uh, know that everyone here is welcome at Jesus' altar, and everyone, without exception, receives the body of Jesus Christ.
Now let us all go forth in the name of Christ. Too. Jamie always likes when you're here because you've got confidence. And you like what you're doing. <laughs> you know, exactly. I know, I, it shows. Exactly, exactly. Well, how is it saying no house? Oh, we're in a few ingredients being transported. It's not like it's a problem about it.